Hello, everyone. I hope you're ready for a Movement Atheism critical episode. I feel I have to give these warnings because this kind of topic really tends to upset people. And I prepare myself to lose Patreon support with each of these critical episodes, but I just can't keep my damn mouth shut. I thank those who pledge to offset the inevitable angry depledging. I do bring you this kind of content at a personal cost, though, when it would be so much easier to just defend the movement or stick to the very acceptable criticizing religion stuff. Now, I've had this episode recorded for over a week because I had just released an episode before recording this one, so I had to space out the release, and I don't have the funding or time or resources to put out more than about two episodes per month. So if you'd like to see me turn stuff around quicker, please consider supporting the show because it's still quite a struggle and your support would be much appreciated. There are thousands who listen and only a small fraction who support. Your support can help keep this podcast going as well as make it possible to do more with it. But Keeping that we recorded way earlier in mind, please know that any positive mentions of David Silverman were obviously from before the story about him being a serial sexual abuser was released on BuzzFeed. Anyway, I've been quite surprised at the defensiveness to Chris Stedman's Are Too Many Atheists Veering Alt-Right piece. Even some liberal, lefty, so-called SJW atheists seem to be doubling down on their defensiveness when it comes to criticizing a problem specific to the atheist scene. Now, I'm not saying the alt-right is only limited to this community, just that there are specific factors here that pull bigots and racists in. It's strange and shocking and depressing to see the denials, because... I think self-criticism and self-reflection can only make things better. And this kind of criticism doesn't come from a place of hostility in this case. Obviously, it's other atheists saying something that needs to be heard. It comes from a place of concern and caring and desire for improvement. Much like my criticism of Islam, it doesn't come from the same place Lauren Southerns would, for example. Us criticizing our own community internally should not be taken as some outside hostile attack on atheists, like many tend to see it. This isn't about discrediting atheism or making it look bad. We're all still in this godless boat together. Except some of us have noticed there are some serious systemic issues. And some of us are more likely to notice because we are more likely to be the target of far-right, alt-right type attacks. Me, being a woman and someone of Muslim background, sadly, I've been noticing a trend of horrid bigotry from people in the atheist scene for years. People with atheist in their bios, people with insert famous atheist profile pictures. And I'll say what I've said when addressing the Muslim community before. Denial helps no one. It prevents the problem from being addressed, in fact. We can say that uh, every group has extremists, and certainly every group does, but... We are talking about the extremism specific to our group that tends to go unnoticed by our group. While extreme voices get promoted by the most prominent atheist figures, and we never ever hear a condemnation of anyone they might have accidentally misrepresented as just merely conservative or someone else they might have promoted as a free speech hero who is now playing footsie with ethno-nationalists, I mean, Sam threatened to quit Patreon over Lauren Southern being banned. He framed her to his audience of hundreds of thousands as merely a conservative journalist. And when he decided he had enough information to stick with Patreon, and that what she did was bad enough for Patreon to remove her, he just linked to their video. But he didn't take back his super mild mischaracterization of her, unless I missed it or something. Or take Lindsay Shepard, the TA who got a talking to for showing a Peterson clip in her class. Sam tweeted that hearing the audio of her being reprimanded by her university would make your blood boil. I've never seen him that passionate in a tweet before. Her profile was raised by such figures. Now she's talking about wanting more nuance between white nationalism and white supremacy. 
None of the prominent free speech atheists who promoted her are talking about the disturbing turn she's taking. Many have positively tweeted out links to friendly softball interviews with extremists like Tommy Robinson and Anne Marie Waters because they were on other atheist shows and spun as good, legitimate critics of Islam. I mean, how does this keep happening? Seth Andrews is fine with ex-Muslims who compare Muslims to Nazis and justify hate crimes against them. He's fine with people befriending open bigots like Ben Shapiro. And he's convinced there's no anti-Muslim sentiment problem in the scene. Shocker, eh? He won't even hear out why there might be problems. He does, however, drop the word extremist very quickly for people who criticize movement atheism. Now, I'm not going to list it all for you, but the terrible associations are endless. This is coming from a movement that has spent so long rightfully criticizing the left when it turns a blind eye to people like Linda Sarsour or Farrakhan. The double standards and hypocrisy are really stunning. Some say that this is a problem of demographics, where there's bound to be racist alt-writers when the largest demographic in a group is white men. Totally missing the fact that this problem extends to non-white people and women in the movement too. Just look at the Dave Rubin brand of ex-Muslims. Not white men, but certainly a convenient shield for claiming you're not bigoted, all the while pushing severely bigoted talking points. Raif Badawi's wife, her Twitter account is indistinguishable from an alt writer's. She now sympathizes with racists like Laura Loomer, Tommy Robinson. Is anyone calling it out? No. In fact, the few who do raise their voices against such things are the ones seen as troublemakers. We're all supposed to generically say that we are against the far right hijacking our critiques of Islam, but we're supposed to keep quiet when we see it happening around us. We can share stats about how atheists in general are more likely to vote Democrat and miss the point that we're talking about movement atheism specifically. And we don't have that data on movement atheism, but if you just look around... If you turn your head in almost any of the most prominent atheist direction, you will see some troubling downplaying of alt-right characters, troubling associations with alt-right and light characters. It's just so hard to deny at this point. It's depressing beyond belief that people are still denying it. And it's people who bear the brunt of that bigotry who are pushed further and further out. There are so many ways to avoid addressing the issue. There is this resistance to see what's pouring out in front of us, causing the word atheist to carry some awful connotations. I would like that to change, so I speak out. I would like not to be associated with that, so I speak out. And I think you should too. If enough of us raise our voices calling this stuff out, it will change. The entryway from atheism to the alt-right is pretty evident right now. It's when criticism of religion goes from being legit, fair, and done in good faith to ahistorical, decontextualized, reactionary bigotry towards theists. We see anti-Muslims and anti-Semites entering through this doorway often. It's the way in which things like racism and sexism are reduced to mere intellectual curiosities, lacking empathy. Are women more neurotic? Are white people's IQs higher than black people's? These discussions are opened up without hesitation, without contextualization, as if they exist in a vacuum and have no bearing on people's lives. Things like this cause people to think this movement isn't a good place for them. Things like this cause people to not want to identify as atheist. You won't believe the emails I get in my inbox. Let's change that by having more honest conversations and making this a more welcoming place that will hear people's grievances rather than deny them. I mean, that's what I thought was going to happen when I found a community outside of religion. But I guess tribalism is a very human problem. But we can certainly try to be more aware of our biases. Now, without further ado, here's Panel 14 with Chris Stedman and James Croft. You can follow them on Twitter at Chris D. S-T-E-D-M-A-N and at J F L Croft C R O F T. Make sure that uh, that program doesn't contain controversial subjects, and uh, you're not impolite to people. No, definitely not, Dad. You know me; I'm never <laughs> ever controversial or yeah, impolite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Welcome to Conversations with your lovable, never pisses anyone off, ex-Muslim host, Ina. Keeping it non-controversial. Welcome to panel 14. We're going to be discussing the controversial question, are too many atheists veering dangerously towards the alt-right today? I have atheist Chris Stedman here who wrote an article for Vice last week on this very topic and caused quite an angry atheist shitstorm. Hello, Chris. Thanks so much for being here today. Hi, thanks for having me. You're welcome. It's very nice to finally talk to you. I've followed you for a while on Twitter. Yeah, the feeling is mutual. Mm. I also have James Croft, an atheist who wrote another article diving deeper into the atheist alt-right connection. I'll link both articles in the show notes so you guys can check them out. Hello, James. Thank you so much for coming on. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. We haven't actually, we don't really know each other online even, so I'm excited to get to talk to you both and see what kind of conversation we have. Thank you. Me too. I think it's going to be awesome. We're going to dive into all the difficult topics and solve them all. We're going to solve all no, the problems. Gosh. Oh, dear. All that's... right, James, let's, uh, let's dial it back just a little. <laughs> no pressure. Like I, I just want to start off by saying that it's so baffling to me that we in the movement are always calling for other groups to speak out against their extremists, to not shield them, and to just you know face the facts and not stick their heads in the sand. But whenever that lens is turned inwards, even a little bit, we tend to display all the same behaviors that we spend so long complaining about. You know what I mean? Well, the reaction was very reflexive. Um, you know, I mean, you can it's it's sort of on display in Jerry Coyne's response, for example. Um, I think he titled his response post <laughs> atheist Chris Stedman disses atheism again. Yes, it's a very and, mature title. You know, yeah, it's it's amusing, but also, I mean, to me, it's kind of revealing because if your read of that article is that it's an attack on atheism, it, it to me suggests that there is a, a kind of hyper defensiveness of any kind of look inward. And, you know, we in the atheist and humanist and, and free thinking and secular community claim to really value, you know, skepticism, but if your skepticism can't be turned inward, um, if we can't apply it to our own community and really look at the norms that we have and ask ourselves, you know, are these norms things that we can interrogate, things that we can look at? Are there pro- are there problems and issues that maybe we need to address? If you can't even say that, um, you know, then I think your commitment to skepticism is lip service. Um, it's not sort of genuine skepticism. Mm-hmm. It's it's fair weather skepticism. Um, yeah. Well, that's especially funny because a lot of the scene is engaging in this cleaning up your own side thing from the angle of being leftist, cleaning up the leftist that they don't agree with or that they think have gone too far. But if you try to, you know, do the cleaning up your own side by trying to trying to call out uh, atheists that are propping up some extreme views or downplaying like the horridness of the alt right, then you just I don't know. Then you just can't be doing that. Then it's it's we're not a movement. You can't criticize the movement. What is the, what is the atheist movement anyway? There's so many ways to deflect that criticism. Then it's like you know it has nothing to do with atheism. Yes, but I mean. Like, I'm a graphic designer. If the graphic design community, like, had a problem with, like, sexism, say, or, like, the Hollywood community has a problem, right? This doesn't mean that it has to do with, like, being in Hollywood or being an actor. It's just that uh, that's how the community evolved to, like, shield certain behaviors. If there were certain problems yes. with the graphic design community, I wouldn't say that it's being a graphic designer that's the that's the root of the problem. Right. And then the, yeah, it's not the, a commentary on atheism itself. Right. Exactly. And then there's the whole, you know, atheism isn't a community. Well, you know, if you can say things like the graphic design community, the legal community, that then you can really say that. Atheism can be a community too. People who frequent the same blogs, the conferences, and all of that, all of a sudden, when it comes to self criticism, it's no longer a community. 
They say yeah. that, you know, atheists don't have the same beliefs. And well, of course, even graphic designers are not a monolith in the way that they think or design or anything. But they're still, yeah. they're still referred to as a community. It's a bizarre response to the criticism, I think. And I actually think James has a really nice response to that. Um, his post, I think, did a really nice job of responding to a lot of the conversation that emerged uh, in the wake of the Vice article. So, uh, James, I don't know if you have anything want to add there, but I think you you responded to that really nicely in your piece. I just want to add that I think you're totally right um, in that I responded it, to it really nicely in my piece. No, I mean, <laughs> that, you're totally right that, that atheism is sort of the amazing vanishing movement. It only exists as long as it's not being criticized. Yeah. And then the moment you raise criticisms about structural features of the movement, like cultures and ways of thinking that are common to movement spaces and organizations, then suddenly there isn't an atheist movement anymore. And as you say, not all atheists believe the same thing. And I find it so bizarre because it's like, well, so there's no atheist movement. Then who funded that conference you just spoke at? And who put together that magazine that's all about atheism? And who's writing all these blogs of which your blog is part of a network of atheist blogs? So like those are all movement things and and atheists are quite happy to accept the existence of an atheist movement when dave silverman talks about it at the american atheist convention but they're not happy some of them some of them are not happy to accept the existence of a movement when it's about the problems with how people behave in those spaces and it's just it's silly defensiveness that doesn't live up to the stated values of the movement itself. And that's the really unfortunate thing about it is that it's so hypocritical that it, it does become kind of dogmatic in its own unwillingness to explore its own faults. And that's kind of where I come at this from is I would like the atheist movement to actually live up to the values that it says that it has. Because I think those values are very important. Mm -hmm. And I think that that means holding to them consistently, whether those values of skepticism and criticism and humane values are pointed externally or internally. Yeah, and I think it means we have to be willing to lose something, which I think is part of the, I mean, I think there's a lot, there are a lot of factors that play into why some people responded to the piece in the way that they did. But I think one of the things is a fear you know, I think atheists who are involved in the movement are used to our movement being very small, to our movement being maligned, to not being recognized in the same way that other movements or communities are. And, you know, we we see ourselves rightfully as, as very sort of marginal, as existing in this liminal space. And I think what that creates in some people is a sort of reticence or a fear to be willing to sort of lose any of the members that we have. And that's a real problem when we're not willing to say we have boundaries on our movement that, you know, there are certain voices that we don't accept um, as a part of our community whose values run counter to the things that we are trying to promote and advance in order to sort of move the societal needle forward. And there was this uh, Guardian piece that someone sent to me about uh, someone who sort of started by listening to and following Sam Harris. And that kind of led the, them down this YouTube rabbit hole to Milo and to others. And it was this kind of each step sort of brought them further and further into the kind of intersection of movement and online atheism and the alt-right. And I think part of the fear that people have is if we say, in the case of Sam Harris, for example, that, you know, there are people that Sam Harris is kind of lifting up, sharing his platform with, um, nodding to, that maybe themselves aren't uh, a, an active part of these sort of white nationalist alt-right movements, but are kind of a stepping stone to those, and that those people then lead to a, a sort of next outer ring and so on and so forth. If we are not willing to say we're going to sort of draw some boundaries somewhere um, because we're afraid that distancing ourselves from anyone and saying, you know, that they don't represent the values of this movement, if we're sort of solely focused on numbers, on trying to grow the movement uh, in every single way that we can, you know, that is, that's going to be a real problem for us moving forward, because eventually, you have to say, these are 
people whose values, whose priorities don't reflect the kind of goals that we have as a movement. And if you can't even say that, something as simple as and basic as that, then, you know, I think the movement's in real trouble. Mm-hmm. Well, now, this, this Guardian article that you speak of, wasn't it like also treated as a joke? Like there was this, uh, I forget what his name is. He was a Twitter anti-SJW troll, um, like a parody of SJWs, and he claimed that he sent this article to The Guardian and it got published, oh, LOL, really? so funny, so funny. You know, I wrote this ridiculous thing and they <laughs> published it. But I don't, as far as I remember, I don't think that he ended up having any proof of it being him. Like well, he, and the reality is, whether that's the case or not, this is not some invented phenomenon. I mean, it's something that I've observed happening in the movement over the years. I've watched people who are very actively involved in the movement go from sort of focusing their attention on so-called, you know, dogmatic religionists, as they would say, to dogmatic social justice warriors, to placing those Mm -hmm. people in the same category and treating them in the same way. And, you know, I know that it's a, it's very convenient that when these kinds of criticisms get turned inward, that, you know, the response is always, oh, that's anecdotal, anecdotal, as if, you know, that's not also a form of data. Um, but I know that, you know, because I've been deeply involved in this movement for a long time and have had a lot of these conversations that ended up resulting in my desire to write this vice piece. I had a lot of these conversations one-on-one with people who were saying, this is something I'm seeing. This is something I'm seeing. This is not some, you know, thing that has only happened a couple of times. That's not really a story worth writing about. This is something that I've personally witnessed, and I know a lot of other people have as well, that happens in this community. It's not some imagined, invented phenomenon. I agree with you, Chris. Uh, I agree that this is certainly something real. It's something that we've experienced over and over again in our attending these conferences and being around movement leaders and organizations for a long time. I think people underestimate a little bit when, if your only participation with the movement is uh, commenting on someone's blog frequently or something like that, or watching YouTube videos, you might miss that when you go to these conferences and you hang around with people who run the organizations or who are on boards of the organizations, you know, some of the inside story of how organizations change and their organizational priorities are decided, then it becomes very clear that some of these problems really exist and they're kind of endemic to the movement. And I've, I just 100% reinforce what Chris said about the reality of this problem. Mm -hmm. I also want to lift up a really important, I think, conceptual feature of the intellectual terrain here, which is that shift which Chris was talking about between challenging religion per se as dogmatic, authoritarian, and unfounded, to challenging what is being perceived or talked about as social justice warriorism, as almost religious in its dogmatism and authoritarianism. And we've seen that shift a lot in some of these figures like Sam Harris, like Dave Rubin, like P- Peter Bogosian, mm. people who have who seem to think they've identified a problem in the left that is as um, infuriating to them, and I think by the heat with which they pursue it, more infuriating mm. to them in some degree, as the problems on the right, and it is this problem of dogmatism and unwillingness to engage multiple ideas, anti-free speech and stuff like that. And I think that shift is really central to a lot of the tension in the atheist community about this, because I think it's very complicated, because I think that, there, of course, there's dogmatism on the left and within social justice communities, because they're communities of human beings, and there's dogmatism in every community of human beings that I've ever been a part of. But the elevation of that experience of dogmatism to essentially the same as being a Nazi or something like that in the minds of some of these people who are writing about it, as if there's no distinction to be made in any other area apart from they're both dogmatic. I think Sorry, that that what do you is, mean as the same as being a Nazi? Like, do they, are you saying that they're perceiving? I think that there is a sense in which in some of the respondents to the increasing interest in social justice concerns that's being shown within secular spaces. Some people are responding to that by 
by claiming to diagnose a problem within the social justice community itself and, and identifying that as essentially a religion, right? So it's just another religion to be fought alongside all these other ones that we've always been fighting. And I think that in terms of the energy and passion with which that thing perceived of as a religion is confronted, sometimes they put more energy into criticizing what they think of as unscientific defenses of anti-racist ideas than they do in tackling unscientific mm -hmm. racist ideas. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. they're really, really offended at what they perceive of as the rejection of the science of race difference in intelligence, how they see it as that. Mm -hmm. That really annoys them. But they're much less offended by the mobilization of junk science mm -hmm. to reinforce racism. Mm -hmm. And that is a kind of weird... So that's what I mean when I say that you've got literal neo-Nazis who are promoting these uh, junk scientific ideas in the public square who have genuine political influence, who have kind of operatives and fellow travelers in the White House, right, who mm. are a real problem for American society. But that's not where their focus is. You're right, their right, it's the campus kids. People on the left, right, <laughs> campus people who don't want to listen to uh -huh. racists coming on their campus, as if that's the real problem in, in our society. And that, I don't, I honestly haven't figured out how that happened, but I think that that is a colossal um, collapse of moral perspective mm -hmm. that is, is very problematic. Yeah, I think the right. overlap with the right-wing talking points also resulted in much more views and rewards and power and fame for a lot of people. So that's the direction that they um, went in. You yeah, know, I when mean, something be becomes curious. more and more rewarding, then you're kind of drawn to it. Yeah, I'd be curious to see, you know, a more in-depth exploration of how that happened as well. But I mean, I think I, you know, I noticed it happening, you know, these sort of smaller shifts earlier on when I was more deeply involved in movement atheism. And I think a lot of people took their cues from folks like Richard Dawkins. And as soon as they saw Richard Dawkins kind of railing against SJWs and that sort of thing, it gave everybody else permission to kind of, you know, it kind of normalized that. And, you know, I think... Dawkins, for example, has, you know, he's tweeted some very troubling things, but he's also, like, I think some of the other kind of bigger names, he's tried to kind of walk this line. And again, I, you know, I don't know him, I can't peer into his mind, so I don't know how intentional it is or not. But they've walked this line of sort of saying some things, but not saying, not going as far as some of the others. And I think, but I think what they've done is they've kind of nodded to this these kind of priorities and it's given others sort of permission to take them and run with them. Mm -hmm. um, well, also just the people that they prop like Dawkins really isn't even one of the worst people for this, uh, uh, propping up strange alt light and alt right type of people and talking points like, but he has too elevated people. Like, I don't know if you remember this guy called jihadist Joe that was around on the scene mm -hmm. And uh, that guy was like a real pretty open bigot. Like, you know, he liked Katie Hopkins and uh, made these jokes about, you know, Muslims being so uncivilized that they were like, you know, goat fuckers or whatever. Just like I, those are not the specific posts yeah. that Dawkins elevated, but Dawkins elevated his other stuff and then his profile generally became bigger and, and a few small time atheist bloggers blocked about it at the time. But there's never like a, there's never a recognition of this fact that this keeps happening, you know, and even, and, and back in the day, I would have pushed back on you. Like, you know, as you mentioned that um, guardian article that, you know, simply listening to Sam Harris's criticisms of religion does not take you down a further and further right wing route. However, now, we see that he's like, you know, doing multiple events with Jordan Peterson, with uh, he, he's had Ben Shapiro, ben Shapiro yeah. with um, this guy called Jeffrey Miller, who's recommended um, anti SJW books by Vox Day, who's a white supremacist. Um, it's just it's it's very hard to deny. You know, I'm coming into this as someone who was a bit on the other side a, a couple of years ago. Yeah, but the other side I mean, was not 
this far gone at that time. Like, I don't think I would have ever stood for like the kinds of stuff that's, you know, like the kinds of views that Peterson spouts. Like I would never, ever have accepted that even in my most anti SJW phase. But now it's just, it's gone like way beyond you. You mock like, you know, Islamist mullahs for talking about hitting women or saying that women can't work. But then we have Jordan Peterson just saying this kind of stuff in a more polished way. You know, I grew up in Saudi Arabia. This stuff sounds very familiar to me. Mm -hmm. And what's dangerous is that Islamists are picking up on these figures and and using them to prop up their Islamist agendas. There are Islamists that love Jordan Peterson. I think that listening to Sam Harris, for example, doesn't obviously doesn't have to take you down this route. I think for the majority of people, it doesn't. Um, I mean, this is, I'm, you know, I don't have any sort of data to back that up. But, you know, despite what was claimed uh, in the last week, you know, I, I'm not arguing, nor would I argue that most atheists are veering toward the alt-right. <laughs> um, but I, you know, and I, I'm close to a lot of people who listen to Sam Harris's podcast every time, who, you know, are, are big fans who are not at all sympathetic to the alt-right, mm-hmm. who in fact really actively oppose it. Yeah, I've um, been a big but, fan of his, but I can't say that right now, but I have been. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think you do have to kind of compartmentalize a little bit. You have to kind of put aside some of the things that he's lifting up, some of the, the people that he's working yeah. with in order to continue to engage in that way. Yeah. Um, but I do think, you know, and this is something that I talked a bit about in my piece and that I think James could say a lot more about, and I'm sure you could as well. Um, but I think that we've got this kind of dangerous confluence of factors because a lot of the people who are looking to figures like Sam Harris are in this group of people who are, you know, you, if you look at the demographic data, for example, among atheists in the U S you know, atheists in the U S are much more likely to be young, white and male, much like the alt-right. So you've got this demographic overlap. You also have uh, the fact that, you know, many of these atheists experience social isolation, they experience family rejection, um, they don't have access to the same kinds of resources for support and community and reflecting on the big questions in life and reflecting on their values. And we know that the alt-right really actively goes after young white men who are seeking identity and belonging and a, a sense of purpose online. And so when you have these gateways, that not everyone is going to go through the gateway, obviously. In fact, most people won't. But when you have these gateways to the alt-right through, you know, these sort of big names in atheism who are lifting up people who are then lifting up people who are lifting up people who sort of lead you to the alt-right. Well, there's I think also it's, it's, Sam downplaying like people like Milo and Lauren Southern, who are pretty clearly alt-right. Like, you know, he said about mm-hmm. Milo that, you know, I don't know if he can be all that alt right because he's so he's gay and so flamboyant (laughs) yeah (laughs) Um, as if there aren't gay people in the alt right i mean there's brown people in the alt right you know what i mean like this is how the new right operates there's it's intersectional and all so (laughs) um and then about lauren southern when she got taken off of patreon um rightfully so because she had endangered the lives of migrants. She went on a ship uh, and shot flares at a rescue boat, I think, in Italy. Uh, She was on video doing this. She did not end up hurting anyone, but she could have. And this is like Mm -hmm. some very extreme activity, like shooting flares at a migrant rescue boat. So Patreon took her off and said they didn't want to be a part of funding, something like that, which I think is perfectly, perfectly acceptable and a good thing to do. But Sam, you know, who claimed not to know enough about the situation, but then at the same time told all his audience that he's going to be, you know, maybe leaving Patreon because this conservative journalist, conservative journalist, he called Lauren Southern, was taken off of Patreon and he thought it was unfair and blah, blah, blah. Now, he said he didn't know enough about the situation, but then when he went and watched the video and he found out enough about the situation he said he's no longer leaving patreon but but he never took back what he said about lauren in terms of just calling her a conservative journalist 
that is really, really downplaying what she is. She's a, like an identitarian alt-right extremist, you know? Well, and, you Majid know, look, Nawaz are, did the same thing recently as well. He called her a conservative Christian. This is not what she is. Right. And people are allowed to not know the full story. They're allowed to, you know, have the opportunity to learn. Yeah. But to not, to not correct those things, I think is really troubling. And to notice a sort of pattern of behavior. I mean, you even have Bill Maher this last weekend criticizing the students at Parkland for boycotting or calling for a boycott of Laura Ingram's show and, you know, saying it's a free speech issue. <laughs> and it's, you know, one time someone does something like that, maybe they don't know the full story. That's, you know, that's sort of one thing. But to see it keep happening again and again, to see the error continue to be made in the same direction, mm -hmm. um, I think is, is what's troubling. And I think, you know, going back to the kind of the confluence of factors, I think the kind of overlap of the cultural features, um, it to me is one of the reasons why this conversation is so important and why I really wanted to write this uh, vice piece and, and why I talked to James for the piece, because I think he has a lot of really valuable thoughts on, you know, what it is, what the kind of cultural features are of movement atheism that might make people who are involved in it perhaps a little bit more open to or susceptible to all right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There's also a conflation going on, right? And tell me what you think about this, James. Like people are like uh, sharing data about like atheists in general, um, you know, maybe voting Hillary oh, or, sure. but this does not, this does not reflect movement to atheism really, because yes. we don't really have the data on that. I think that's true. I think that one of the, deflection tactics that people have been using to try and avoid this criticism very understandably because people don't like it when movements they're involved in that they care about that are a significant part of our identity are criticized but one of the deflection mechanisms is to say things like well atheists as a whole are more liberal than they are conservative and i'm certain that the evidence that demonstrates that is true given the demographics and social politics of religion in america but that is really not the point. And, and the article that Chris wrote, and I agree with it, did not say that most atheists are more conservative than most religious people. It was lifting up certain structural features of the atheist movement that have these troubling overlaps. We should investigate to make sure that we're doing all that we can to drive people in a different direction. And I think that it's just super disingenuous of people who know better, who can certainly read and are capable of thinking through the distinction between all atheists and some atheists and individual atheists and the atheist movement to point to these articles about atheists in general and their political views as if it absolves the atheist movement of any sort of responsibility or complicity with this social current that's starting to flow towards this sort of right-wing thinking. And mm -hmm. I, I really do want to stress the importance of a broad contextual approach to these sorts of questions. One of the things that I see again and again in these discussions, and I hear it a lot when Sam Harris is challenged or some of the things he's, he's done or written or when people raise these problems with movement figures, is that people kind of try and decontextualize everything. And they say, well, this is what he actually said, or this is one sentence, what he said, what's wrong with that one sentence? Mm. Or this is one thing he retweeted, what's wrong with that individual tweet? Or it, it becomes this kind of denuding of context, and then the defense of the tiny little incident outside of any broader political or social context. But once you start to appreciate that you're in Canada, but Chris and I are in the United States, in the United States, you're working in a context where, you know, disturbingly right-wing president with authoritarian tendencies has just been elected, who's shown himself significant forms of affiliation with very unpleasant extreme right-wing views, individuals, ideologies, that in the culture as a whole, uh, Muslims are a marginalized minority mm -hmm. group, that the way that the alt-right particularly functions, but also a lot of extreme right-wing politics is through cultural signaling and dog whistles mm -hmm. and forms mm -hmm. of communication that have plausible deniability built in. 
And mm-hmm. so you have to look at trends. You have to understand how the way that people say something explicitly is not always everything that they mean and there's always undercurrents. So you really have to put all this stuff into a broad social and political context. And mm-hmm. it's when you do that and you see, as Chris was saying, you know, the same quotes, mistakes being made again and again in the same direction. I think that's a good way to put it. When you see how much energy is expended towards some issues over others. So here's an hour and a half on why Charles Murray is not as bad as you think it is. <laughs> but you'll get 10 seconds at the beginning saying, of course, racism is, is wrong. Mm. In the right. context of a culture which is itself deeply racist, where Charles Murray's mm-hmm. views, far from being unspeakable, are the unspoken prejudices. Well, and also Martin Charles Williams. Murray, there's a lot more context to who he is, you indeed, know? Indeed, indeed. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I think you're right. That that he has a history himself as a conservative pundit. He, not, and not he, just a history, but a you know a presence. A presence. I mean, he was right. He. I just saw him on Twitter the other day defending the comment from Kevin Williamson at the Atlantic. The about, hanging uh, women and, comment. Yeah. Yeah. About women who have had abortions. You know. I mean, this is someone who whose views are not that mild and and misunderstood. I mean, this is someone whose views are very extreme. Yes, this is, I mean, this is really, they, they're they shocked that that hanging, you know, we should hang women who have abortions comment is beyond the pale. That's what's shocking to them, not the comment itself. Right. It, this is, yeah. the priorities boggle my mind. And then at the same time, you claim you're on the left, you claim you're a liberal. Can you just at least admit honestly that you're not? At least let's yeah. start there. And, you know, I mean, to go back to the the point about sort of responding with the with data about atheists as a sort of larger group, um, even though you know the pieces are specifically talking about a phenomenon within movement atheism, you know you had Jerry Coyne in his third response post talking about this data <laughs> and saying this is a definitive refutation of what I had written. Uh, <laughs> we won't even get into the second post. Can you just um, yeah? Mean, can you can. can you just give a, a little <laughs> breakdown of how many responses Jerry had to your uh, vice piece? Uh, so far it was three in three days. So obviously this was something that uh, didn't bother him at all. Um, <laughs> bless but, Chris. What, what'd you say? I said, you're blessed with his attention. Oh, yes. Um, but no, his second post was, uh, was pretty spectacular where he did a, he did this very long initial post responding to my piece that was all about how wrong I was, how I was attacking atheism and at the end, he prompted his readers essentially to say that they do condemn the alt-right and sexism and Richard Spencer. And lo and behold, somehow 96% or something <laughs> of respondents said that they did, which, you know, is definitely reflective of, of their true feelings. There's no way that they could have been lying. Um, and there's no way that all that prompting that Jerry Coyne did kind of influenced their response in any sort of way. And then he, uh, you know, went on Twitter the next day and tweeted it at me and and asked if, you know, I would accept this data uh, that he had (laughs) produced in his words. It proved that my piece was incorrect, which is just amazing. Um, It's charming, isn't it? He's a scientist, um, I believe. (laughs) So, but anyway, so in this third piece, he, he, you know, he he pulls this data from 2009 and... um, says that this, you know, is the definitive, this definitively refutes um, what I've written. But the reality is, A, he, you know, he's sort of taking my piece in bad faith. I'm, I'm not attacking atheism. But more importantly, you know, yes, as he points out, less religious countries do tend to be more tolerant in, in these ways. But it's an, it's an ecological fallacy to infer things about individual behavior from these aggregate patterns. And most of all, I was not making an aggregate statement about atheism, majority of atheists. I was pointing out one pathway that a minority of atheists take that I think is important to reflect on, especially in light of some of the cultural features of movement atheism and some of the leading figures in movement atheism. Including you know, Jerry Coyne. This is what was especially right. interesting to me is that, Oh yeah. You look know. at his posts on Charlottesville. I mean, you know, I think he wrote three or four posts on Charlottesville and the bulk of them, he was talking about, you know, the the kind of extreme left in Charlottesville and, and the right. Of course, you know, we, of course, we, we condemn the right. But look at this extreme left 
Mm. Um, you know, he was doing very much kind of what James was, was just describing. Mm. Um, I, I was going to pick up something that Chris said there that I think is really important to understanding this is this, of course, we all condemn the alt-right or white supremacy or whatever. I feel like there is the assumption in some parts of the atheist movement that everybody agrees that sexism is wrong, that homophobia is wrong, that racism is wrong. And so we don't have to talk about that. What I'm going to talk about is the stuff that people don't agree about, which is this left-wing authoritarianism and this left-wing dogmatism, because that's the thing that will surprise people or that we don't already agree on. And I think that's such a dangerous perspective that only people who are not subject to racism and homophobia mm -hmm. and sexism mm -hmm. could hold because we live in a profoundly racist, sexist, homophobic and other phobic culture. And some indications suggest, particularly politically, that the, the trends are moving in the wrong direction on those things, that things are getting worse. And it would seem to me that your priority in that situation would be to say, wait a minute, we need to reinforce our commitment to anti-racism and anti-sexism, etc., not spend much more time focusing on these problems on the periphery of the left. And I do think that that problem in prioritization can be seen as an emanation of atheist movement culture specifically, mm. because I think that it is partly the, the self-perception of atheists as kind of champions of truth and free inquiry, which can become, if it's not placed within a context of other moral concerns, this dogmatic insistence on unfettered exploration of every idea, however dangerous or damaging that idea is, however discredited the idea is, we must always support the person unwilling to say the unpopular thing. And over. always give them a platform. Yeah. And right. So it's on like that owed every platform. That's what it means to be an atheist. It means to right. challenge there, every you know, taboo. But no, but, but that's not even true because I remember like four years ago when Islamists or like, you know, not obvious Islamists, but like some people with shady associations were invited to universities to speak, um, you know, in the UK. And I believe that the same people who go all out um, saying hate speech isn't a thing and, you know, don't criticize Tommy Robinson, don't criticize Richard Spencer, let them speak, and that's the only way to discredit them, blah, blah, blah. Those people were argue were making the same arguments to, like, um, the universities that, that they should not be inviting these Islamists because these people do not deserve a platform. So back then, people were, were reasonable, you know? If you look at their tweets about the same issues now and then... They're completely different. Well, and I think to go even one step further, some of these folks, they continue to support the idea that not everyone should have a platform when it serves the narratives that they are sort of trying to support. And when it doesn't, then they don't. And it is it is hypocritical. And, you know, I think what James was saying is so right on because, you know, you've got people in the atheist movement, for example, who really champion, you know, Steven Pinker's work mm. around the the world is getting better, it's getting less violent, it's getting more cooperative, and he looks at this data and he makes this argument, but they never stop, uh, well, and uh, obviously, I'm generalizing, I'm, I'm certain that there are people who do stop, but some of them do not stop and ask themselves, who is the world getting better for, and who is it not? Mm -hmm. And I think that it reveals a set of priorities that are aligned with sort of maintaining the status quo and not challenging those who are in positions of privilege and power. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think, as James says, it's because for many of them, they are operating out of a place of not experiencing some of these things. It reminds me so much of years ago when I would, you know, write about um, Islamophobia or anti-Muslim sentiment. Mm -hmm. um, within movement atheism or within our broader culture, or I would write about the value of trying to work with faith communities to advance social justice, I would get these very heated criticisms from people, and they would often be couched in this language that, to me, read very much as sort of, um, if not overtly homophobic, at least sort of um, emasculating um, I was cast as as weak, as wimpy, as oh you know, well. Now we have you know 
respected professor, Gad Saad, respected by Sam Harris himself, you know, calling people ladyboy or castrati or castrato or whatever. Um, <laughs> oh, sure. And making jokes about, you know, being married to Peter Bogosian and, Peter you know. Peter Bogosian, who thinks that, you know, feminist men have a weak body habitus and. <laughs> right. Oh, and who, <laughs> you know, doesn't really understand how someone could be proud to be gay. How can you be proud of something you didn't have to work for? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Which, again, reveals a complete failure to understand the experience of the majority of gay people. But, you know, and it's, and I think for a lot of these people, part of that unwillingness or inability to really look at these things comes from essentially a lot of their worldview and the the kind of ideas that they have spent a lot of their, you know, professional careers or lives um, promoting or uh, deeply caring about are built on this sort of house of cards that the foundation of which is sort of uh, rooted in this idea that religion is the problem. Without religion, the world would be a better place. Um, I'm obviously sort of simplifying the position of a lot of these people, but in my eyes, it's a much more complicated sort of confluence of things that can be certainly um, exacerbated by the presence of religion, mm -hmm. but that is inherently more complicated than that. That is more deeply human, that has a lot more to do with a sort of tribalism mm -hmm. than it does with religion itself. And, and that these are things that can express themselves through other venues besides religion. Oh, absolutely. To acknowledge that, it's more complicated than just saying religion is the problem would sort of undo this house of cards for some yeah, people. And that's so, so true. There's unwillingness to even go there. That's so true. They have so much invested in it. Their whole identity is invested in it. Right. And so, yeah. When you say that religion is the problem and then you sort of start to put these things in that category, you say homophobia, that's a religious problem. Transphobia, that's a religious problem. Uh, mm -hmm. racism that's a religious problem then you sort of shield yourself from any sort of self-criticism you and you have this idea that rejecting religion means you've kind of inoculated yourself against these prejudices yeah. that you see as an expression of religion right and that's why on sam harris's I think it's very yeah it, it absolutely is we saw on sam harris's podcast uh him and douglas murray i don't know if you ever listened to that one but they were like snickering about you know, trans people for a good, like, I don't mm -hmm. know, five minutes or so. I think Doug yeah, I that. Douglas said it was the people do, doing it to, for attention and just like some terrible things. And Sam was like, he wasn't saying much, but he was like, oh, would you get in as much trouble as me? Uh, I was just. Well, and that's exactly what we're talking about. It's not as if Sam Harris was saying those things, but he also wasn't challenging them. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, he, exactly. He was laughing along, he was not saying anything. And you know, people can then, what they, what it allows people to do is to say, well, Sam didn't say that, you know, mm -hmm. and of course he didn't. No yeah. one is saying that he said that, but we are pointing to a willingness to not push back against those things. Oh yeah. And then keep supporting those people. Like, I mean, Douglas Murray is a person who thinks that um, London is not white enough anymore. And he worries about this. Like literally he's written an article about how the census shows some troubling things and at what percentage of white people would the celebrants of diversity be happy at and what can white people do but just accept their fate that they're going to be, you, you know, fading away. This is just like some really <laughs> troubling, yes. troubling talk. And I pointed this specifically out to Sam in my chat with him. So it's not that he's not aware. But since mm -hmm. then, he's been happily promoting and, you know, championing Douglas Murray who is, you know, different from Charles Murray, for anyone confused. But, yeah. Yes, it's just all people named Murray. <laughs> I, I, I listened to that podcast where you, you confronted Sam Harris with something that Douglas Murray had said, and you gave him a quote that I seem to remember was about how there's a demographic time bomb ticking in Europe, and it's about Muslims and having too many Muslims, basically, mm -hmm. and that we should think about not allowing Muslims in, into Europe. And... I thought that Harris's response was very indicative of many of the problems that we've been discussing today, particularly uh, the firstly, he didn't immediately condemn it. Mm -hmm. He didn't. His first instinct was not to say, I disagree with that. That's wrong. I find that deeply offensive in the context of you know, Europe. 
uh, has anti-Muslim prejudice as well as America does. I'm from the United mm -hmm. Kingdom. I know it exists in, in the United Kingdom, and it's a profound problem there. And so one's first instinct, one would think, in hearing this clearly bigoted remark would be to say that's bigoted and wrong. But that's not what Sam Harris did. Instead, he did this total decontextualization thing I was talking about where he was like, well, let's take each sentence and then see if there's a possible charitable, like hyper charitable interpretation of that sentence and talk about it for a good long time and then say, I can see why someone would think something like that. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. seems like in his mind, what it means to be intellectually honest and responsible is to look at everything totally in its own little tiny bubble, try and find if he, if he has some sort of agreement with the idea, a way that it can be justified. Only for and some then, people. Uh, yes, right. It's, well, I was going to say, it's a kind of charity yeah. that is never shown it, to religion, for example. Right, you right. Know, and and I, look, religion yeah. doesn't need to be defended, you know, but what I'm more interested in is why, again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier, why it seems to always go in a certain direction and not in another. Yeah, and I think we know the answer to that question. I think it's because, I think we can say at this point quite clearly, because Harris is sympathetic to the fundamental critique there. He, he is bought into a notion that there is a looming kind of, clash of civilization mm -hmm. and that this has to be confronted and that i mean maybe i don't know how he views it but you know it's better to have problematic allies on who are basically on the right side than people who are not on the right side like those leftists who don't want culture to become hugely racist but <laughs> the it, it's just the response to it was so indicative of this kind of common, and I honestly think it's a particularly atheisty movement -y thing, that with some issues, one mobilizes a certain set of the tools of rationality to justify the position that you wanted to hold already, which is, in this case, there's something really wrong with Islam, or in other cases, it might be that there really isn't such thing as a trans person or what, whatever it is. But it's not, that's not real rationality, right? That's not what one should be doing when you're interested in the truth of a matter and you're interested in the truth of it because you want a world in which everybody flourishes and everyone has full freedom. It's a very limited uh, manipulation of the tools of rationality in order to support an ideological agenda that has terrible consequences for some people. Yeah, and it's it is very unfortunate. I think that anyone who is seen as being on the left, um, in you know, for the sake of this conversation, is you know not afforded any of that generosity or very little of it. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, this. I think if we want an example of this, we can look at the response to the you know article over the last week. I mean, you know, I wrote this piece, you know, not because I wanted to attack atheism, but actually because I really deeply care about this movement, about mm -hmm. this community. Mm -hmm. It's something that I've been, that I've given, you know, the better part of the last decade of my life to. It's not something that I, you know, am interested in seeing have less sort of presence and prominence in our culture. I've consistently wanted to see it have more uh, of an influence and involvement mm -hmm. in our broader society and i think part of what that requires is addressing internal issues and yet you know i think the majority of of people who had an issue with the article and you know i i, I absolutely grant that you know people can have legitimate criticisms of the article i think that there are, you know i honestly think that there are people who can make the argument that I was trying to make much better than I can. I mean, I think James is a great example of one of them. <laughs> I would absolutely, you know, never claim to be the authoritative expert on these things. Um, I, I, but I wrote it because I deeply care about these things. And yet it's received as an attack. It's, you know, responded to in not only sort of ungenerous ways, but in ways that really uh, morph what it, what it is into something that it's not that mm -hmm. turn it into uh, an attack on atheism 
that turn it into a piece that's suggesting that most atheists are sliding to the alt right, and it just it 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 baffles me that we don't have more of a culture of sort of internal criticism in a movement that claims to really value truth and reason and skepticism. It's it's always been, you know, this is not a new phenomenon. We've long struggled with internal criticism, but it has baffled me from the very beginning that there is, I mean, it, it doesn't baffle me in the sense that this is a very human phenomenon. This is not an atheism problem. This yeah. isn't all you know, all communities struggle with this in different ways yeah. based on the differences in, in movement cultures. But it does baffle me considering the things that we say are important to us as a group of people that bind us as a, a movement and a community that we are not more comfortable with this kind of internal criticism, especially when, you know, as we were just discussing, we are told to be more generous to these figures um, like Charles Murray, that we don't have that same kind of internal generosity, I think is, is it does, it's, it's going to be a real problem if we want to grow as a movement, if we can't have these kinds of conversations internally. Well, yeah, it's a movement that says they value like, you know, ideological diversity and dissenting opinions. They really don't when it's like dissenting in terms of, oh, yeah, you know, a woman who disagrees with feminism, sure. A, a oh, person who's criticizing um, Islam, you know, an ex-Muslim criticizing Islam, sure. But an atheist who wants to also come at some criticism of the movement from within, no, 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 that's just not acceptable. I totally agree with you. Right, I was, right. I was ironically suggesting that that Chris's laughter is not justified, but of course it's justified. And it does happen in pretty much every movement where people who are within it but criticize problems in it are often made to feel like they should not be in it. And that is an unfortunate tendency of human beings who create groups, particularly groups around shared items of identity that are important to the people who who are members of it. But it is pretty interesting how a movement which really prides itself on honestly investigating reality is sometimes so resistant to critique. And it's just... I don't know. I have no more dis disappointment to give to the atheist movement. I, I've run out of disappointment. It's just kind of <laughs> exasperating. But you set it I, up, you, you, you put a really good and important disclaimer, I think, in your article where, when you said that, you know, this movement has given me many warm memories and I broadly value my participation in it. What follows is in no sense an attack on the community of which I am a part. Rather, it is an analysis of some problems with that community, which I think we have a responsibility to address, criticism at its best is meant to improve its object. And that is the spirit in which I offer the following thoughts. And I think, you know, it, it should go without saying, but I think clearly people are very sensitive and raw about this. So it's very important that you put that in there. And I wish people would stop perceiving it as some like bunch of outsiders just hating on atheism and not as atheists trying to better the the movement itself and i just want to go back to jerry coin for a second like him and i you know we used to communicate often and email each other and i, I considered him a friend right um but then it came to like criticizing the far-right associations within our circles right and i used i did a podcast about criticizing islam in the era of trump or something something like that in which i mentioned that Gad and Rubin specifically are causing much harm to the discussion around Islam by palling around with uh, white genociders. Specifically, I mentioned uh, Paul Joseph Watson. And then Jerry wrote a whole blog post about how, you know, I'm right to say that we should want to distance ourselves from the far right, which he's fine with generally saying that. But when it comes to actually speaking out against specific people, He's not interested in that at all. So in action, he doesn't want to do it. So he wrote, but Ayn is too harsh on Gad and Rubin. And the background to this is that another post that Jerry had put up, met quoting me, caused Gad to go into a like five-day meltdown, like hurling abuse at me. So he knows the history that, that Gad has calling me names um, when I simply just criticize his ideas. That was not, you know, nothing was mentioned about Gad going too far on that. But when I say specifically and point out who, 
uh, I'm going too far criticizing Gad mm. Sad. And he just said, of course they don't associate with white genociders or, you know, he just denied it. And then a bunch of people told him on Twitter, like they showed him pictures, they showed him, they linked him to, you know, their podcast where they specifically did this stuff. I emailed him, I invited him to chat about this. He just wasn't having it. He did not want to correct his falsehood. He did not want to discuss it any further. And that was it. And then we never really communicated again after that. So mm. this is what happens a lot. And People say the right things, but then they don't do it when it comes time to like put it into practice. Well, and it's unfortunate because there's also not really an acknowledgement of the toll that it takes on people who do dissent from some of these norms. I've watched over the years a lot of people who had incredible talents leave movement atheism mm -hmm. because they felt like not only were their priorities, you know, sort of not reflected in some of the um, sort of actions or the words of, you know, some of our sort of most visible advocates, but who also experienced extreme harassment and abuse from people who had problems with the, the things that they said. And, you know, I think we have this, this issue within movement atheism that a kind of empathy issue there where we, we think that people, sh you know, should just tolerate that, that that's part of what you get for speaking out about certain things that that's, you know, that that is somehow okay. And even if they don't explicitly condone it, they don't, criticize it. They don't speak out against it. They, you know, they sort of silently allow it. And it's, it's a real problem for us because again, I've watched people who bring skills that our movement desperately needs leave mm -hmm. because they felt like it wasn't a space where they didn't feel like it was worth what they had to endure in order to continue to be active in the community. And it's, it's really unfortunate. I mean, it's something I've experience and I know that James has experienced it I know other people have mm -hmm. and you know it's uh I I don't think that the the cost of admission to being in, involved in movement atheism and being a part of these conversations should be having to endure homophobic abuse racism you know sexism and I I feel like we need a word for this I feel like there's a there should be a term out there for this particular wing of the movement has become like the Dave Rubin wing. I don't know what that is, but that... The classical liberals? <laughs> is that what they call... I, I find that very unfortunate because I was always uh, very enamored with what I thought was classical liberalism when I was studying politics when I was a kid, you know, like James yeah, Mill and stuff themselves. like that. Yeah. Is that what they call themselves? That's what they call that, themselves. That's unfortunate mm -hmm. because that has positive connotations in my mind, but it's just there's there is a cultural tendency there. It is a subset of the atheist movement, I think, but it's a growing one, I'm pretty sure, and it's where a lot of the money and energy and fame and attraction seems to be, and so people are going to move there. I think I know you've said that a few times that people are going to move where they get the hits and they get the. Mm -hmm. Um, support for their views when they get to have Sam Harris on the podcast or I've never even heard of Gad Sad before today but yeah. you know lucky oh, you was, was, I know this encounter with him was years ago when Sam Harris and I had that back and forth you remember James yeah and he uh suggested that I um go to a Muslim majority country wearing a shirt that said there's no God and I'm gay and see how people <laughs> respond to me and Sam thought that was so such an inc incisive rebuttal <laughs> of what I had written that he quoted it in his response to me and and I think it was to me and PZ Myers wow that really is sad um I think that there yeah there, there's clearly this current and I think it is a kind of atheistic current and it's, it set itself up as opposed to what it perceives of as the authoritarian left or the regressive left or whatever they want to call what they're thinking of. And it seems to think that opposing that is the most important thing that one can possibly do in 21st century world. And I just don't share that analysis of the social and political challenges that we face as a species right now. I actually think that that's really yeah. far down on the list mm. And, and there is a, a kind of 
false equivalence, as you suggest, well, James, hugely. between, I mean, they talk about, you know, campus protests as being on the same sort of level. And, and you, they don't well, explicitly that, right. say that, that it is, although sometimes I think they do, but they, 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 they put do. it in the same category as, you know, the march in Charlottesville. And uh, that's, that's they, exactly right. I heard a episode of Intelligence Squared, the debating program, which was debating whether the left is on the right side of history or something like that, whether basically the left is morally superior. And David Brooks, the columnist, who I don't really associate necessarily with this kind of classical liberal thing or what we're calling classical liberal thing, but he was talking about, there was a question from the audience about what are the worst versions of rightism and leftism. And he said, well, on the right, you have, you know, real neo-Nazis and white supremacists marching in, in American cities. And on the left, you know, you've got those kids on college campuses who protest when, when fascists come to speak. And he spoke about those two as if they were morally equivalent, as if on the one hand, A, but on the other hand, B, and A and B are really bad. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, though, they do protest sometimes when people are not fascists. Right, they do. It's a real right. problem. And I, I was going to say, there's not to say that there's nothing there, but it's the yeah. equivalence that is, I think, such yeah, a, yeah. it's such a, a scary thing to me. Because the more it's said, the truer it feels for people. Right, right. And then, you know, people like Boghossian step in to say that, you know, we should put put a moratorium on the word Nazi. And I jokingly quote him with an article, um, you know, talking about two swastika-waving, Sig Heiling shooters. And Peter Boghossian actually says, no, these are not Nazis. So, yeah. I mean, they're like... That's the world we live in now. Yeah. And they're so the worried that- about people overusing the term Nazi, that they actually become the opposite and don't want to use it even for swastika-waving shooters. Right. I think they believe, too, that more people share their views than actually do. And, you know, so you've got a lot of these figures pointing to the demographic shifts around religious affiliation in the United States and saying, Look, you know, the the fastest growing segment of the religious landscape is the religious nuns, the N-O-N-E-S's. Mm-hmm. And, you know, more and more people are not religious. But the reality is, you know, the majority of these people who are religiously unaffiliated aren't sharing their views. I mean, this is exactly what some of the responses to the Vice piece have suggested. Um, it is true that the nuns are much more likely to be uh, leftist and progressive mm-hmm, mm-hmm. than, you know, other groups are. And maybe I'm not correct about this, but I think that eventually uh, some of these figures are going to realize that they're completely out of step with the population that they're claiming to represent mm-hmm. or that they want mm-hmm. to represent. Um, but I, it's just surprising to me that they haven't already figured that out. And what's also interesting is that this piece that was a rebuttal to your piece, which started with a straw man headline, which said that, you you know, no, most atheists aren't veering alt-right when you simply said too many are. It, so Hamant, who, who I usually really like his uh, views and, you know, he was really good on the Krauss thing, but he's also, you know, I think he's posted about certain ex-Muslims that have some really troubling views. Like there's, a group of ex-Muslims that likes to that likes this meme of you know Islam, Judaism, basically all the religions are worse than Nazism in a time where not neo-Nazis are rising. I mean, it's the most disgusting thing. You know, there are like secular Jews messaging them on Facebook saying, you know, seeing an image of the swastika and the Star of David and a pile of shit together as if they're the same is very very uh, offensive. And they just hang on to these pedantic, like, oh, you know, we're criticizing the belief, not the people. And it's like, yeah, but there are much better and more effective, uh, less reductive, less juvenile, uh, less reactionary ways of criticizing Islam and Judaism than comparing it to, to Nazism. And they are the same people who say that leftists have used the word Nazi so much that the word has been watered down, yet they are, you know, saying that, all the world's religions are like no it's so true you know? and i think it i think it does a real disservice to to 
you know, thoughtful religious criticism, which is so important. I mean, this is not right. But these are the people that you know. What you say about the ex uh, about the atheist movement applies even more heavily in the ex-Muslim scene because I guess they're coming out of, out of Islam, and there, there's a tendency for them to be embraced so quickly by. Uh, the right and far right that some people get caught up in it, some people get swept up in it. This is where the rewards are. So as mm -hmm. an ex-Muslim myself who does not subscribe to that and who actively tries to, you know, push uh, any type of right-wingers trying to latch on to my criticism of Islam away, I'm, I've been very, very worried about where the ex-Muslim movement is, is headed. So I see that a lot of people who wouldn't tolerate these kinds of views from like, you know, non-ex-Muslim atheists are willing to give ex-Muslim atheists a pass because, oh yeah, you know, so-and-so had a very abusive upbringing under Islam. And, and look, I understand that, but that's no, that's no reason to give it a pass. Like as much as anyone, anyone on the left saying that, oh, so-and-so had a terrible experience with racism. And so, you know, now they say all this Islamist bullshit. That's not <laughs> something you can excuse either, either way. So... Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that we have to get away from the idea that there's that something that is understandable given someone's background is also moral. Mm -hmm. and I think that we just need to make the distinction. I can understand why a lot of people hold the unethical views that they hold and why they might be driven to do things that I consider to be wrong. But that doesn't excuse what they are doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to be really vigilant wherever this tendency comes from to say it's not okay to do that, to promote that set of ideas or mm -hmm. to write in this way about this group simply because you have had a terrible experience with that group or your – that you still have to be bound by your responsibilities as an ethical agent towards other people, regardless of what your experience is. And that doesn't diminish the empathy we can have for people's experiences. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we can't say we really have to address the reasons why people hold the views that they have in order to understand them and in order to give them the kind of, to, to respect their full humanity. But that doesn't mean giving the behavior a pass. Right. Pause yeah. And from a particular place. I actually think not only does it not diminish empathy, I think it can increase empathy. You know, I, I think that the best way to honor the, you know, past painful experiences someone has had is to encourage them to engage with those things in a way that is honest. I mean, for me anyway, you know, I had a very difficult personal experience with fundamentalist Christianity when I was younger around being queer. This is something mm -hmm. you, you and I have talked about a lot, James. And part of what has been really helpful for me, you know, I went through a period after I stopped being a Christian of, you know, being very angry about mm -hmm. it personally and having a lot of very negative feelings toward Christianity and in particular toward fundamentalist Christians. And part of what has helped me kind of come to terms with that and make peace with it is an honest reckoning with it and is to be able to um, move from my sort of generalizing things based on my personal experience to taking an honest look and saying, okay, here are some of the very real problems within these communities. These are some of the reasons and some of the ideas that exist within these communities that caused me and many other people to have those experiences. And here's a possible way forward. And so I think part of, you know, honoring somebody's trauma is wanting to see that person have a, a sort of honest reckoning with, with things. Mm -hmm. um, at least for me, that was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Now, before we close this off, I'd like to sort of put to you some of the criticisms that were in the rebuttal piece that I read. And maybe, you know, each of you can respond to one of the things that I read out. Does that sound okay? Yeah, or we could just give them all to James. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> okay. We talked about the one where, you know, they already they say it's important to note that atheists are not part of a cohesive religious group. We don't have doctrines or dogmas or scripture. And we don't have, quote unquote, leaders. Well, we do have leaders who speak on behalf of all of us. Sure, not on behalf of all of us, but there are noted leaders in the movement. 
There are, of course, people who run organizations that promote secularism, as well as advocates for those ideas who have a large reach, but no one would reasonably, reasonably suggest that anyone functions as an atheist pope, deciding what the rest of us believe or don't. The fact that someone is an well, atheist... sure, no one would reasonably suggest that, nor has anyone. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. A lot of these are just, you know, straw man arguments. Um, the other one that I found interesting was... Stedman lumps together everything from criticism of Islam to frustration with identity politics to accusations of sexual harassment to outright endorsements of Trump as part of a singular mindset that must be stopped. What do you say to that, Stedman? <laughs> I mean, I don't think that I did do that. If I did do that, I think it's absolutely worth criticizing, but I wouldn't. That's not something that I believe. So I can here, let me just clearly state for the record I do not believe that all of those things are lumped together. I absolutely believe that there is not just a place, but an important place for criticism of Islam, of all religions, um, especially when religious ideas are used to dehumanize, harm, and support the subjugation of people. And if anything, you know, I think that that is entirely consistent with the social justice views that we are often sort of criticized for holding. So... Yeah, I mean, like so much of the piece, in my eyes, they're responding to something that I didn't say, and they're mischaracterizing what I did say. So I'm I'm happy for the opportunity to make that clear, but um, it it's not yeah, it's okay. not something that I actually think. And you know, I would the one other thing I would say briefly is I was really struck by one line in particular in the response piece that was published on the Friendly Atheist which was the, the part where they, and it's unclear who wrote this specific sentence. I know they both uh, contributed, both Hemant and also uh, David contributed to that piece. But there was a line, and I think it was kind of near the end or maybe two thirds of the way down, that said that the only quote unquote bad atheist is one who believes in a God. And, you know, I don't want to mischaracterize what they meant by that. But it sounds to me like the statement is saying that the the only yeah, if you're if you're reading it literally, that the only bad atheist is one who believes in a God. And it just seems like if not such a uh troubling thing to say, at least a very tone deaf thing to say in light of this conversation. Tone deaf definitely we're yeah. having right now and also the sort of broader conversations that have been having happening in movement atheism. Um, around Lawrence Krauss, around others. I mean, it just, you know, I, to me, it was revealing of the fact that, again, there is this sort of knee-jerk defense of atheism that I think does not serve us if we want to be a free-thinking community, um, to be able to say, no, there are people within this community that don't represent, you know, we can talk about sort of two different kinds of atheism. We can talk about sort of atheism broadly, and we can talk about movement atheism. But what we're talking about is movement atheism. Mm -hmm. And that means that there are people who represent the community. There are people who support the community, participate in it. And we need to be able to draw, and this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, we need to be able to draw the boundaries somewhere. So I think that that, that sentence was unfortunate. I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think they're saying that, you know, all the atheism is, is like a lack of belief in God. So you can't add all these other things to it. Uh, you know, but that's not how we treat it. Right? right. That's not how it how it actually operates as a movement. Right. The movement clearly has some like very popular views and ideas going through it, running through it. So, uh, just to say that the only way to be a bad atheist is to to believe in God, it, it, it's pretty tone deaf. But okay, so so James, I'll I'll give you the next criticism, and you can field that one. I'm ready. <laughs> Deadman is falling into the same trap as Christian apologists who claim atheism is evil because of people like Stalin and Pol Pot. Just because they were atheists doesn't mean they were acting to advance atheism. Yeah, we hear that response an awful lot when people make criticisms of the atheist movement is that just because some bad individual was an atheist doesn't indict atheism per se. And I can understand why people say that because it is the case that occasionally religious people and people who want to promote particular religious views do say, 
well, look at Stalin, you know, he was an atheist and that's where atheism mm -hmm. gets you. Mm -hmm. And so I can see the resistance to that way of thinking. But that, of course, is not what Chris was saying. And it's not what I was saying either. It was much more about exactly what Chris was just talking about, looking at the atheist movement and the common ways of thinking and speaking and acting within that movement, which has its own distinct culture and its own way of doing things, which is evident whenever you go to these conferences. When you can go to a conference in Memphis, Tennessee, and then go to a regional conference in New England, and there be similar speakers and similar ways of talking about things and similar ways of interacting with each other in those places, it's because there is a movement culture. And it's within that culture that certain ideas and ways of thinking become prioritized. And that's what really was being discussed. Now, I think it's true that it's possible to imagine forms of the atheist movement that are quite different culturally, where different ideas were lifted up. One mm -hmm. of the things that I found interesting about the response to my article is that someone wrote to me saying, well, what would an atheist movement even be about if it wasn't about religion? And I thought that was a very revealing question because I can think of about a million things it could be about mm -hmm. if it wasn't about religion, but many people cannot. And that is a cultural issue with the atheist movement as it is presented and promoted in the United States. And so I think that the criticisms that Chris and I were advancing were not about atheism per se. Atheism as an intellectual idea or as a religious viewpoint. It was about the movement that absolutely exists in the United States that's promoted by individuals and organizations and written about in books and in spoken about on podcasts, and that movement has some issues to examine because in some of the ways that it does things, it's encouraging thoughts and behaviors that are ultimately inhumane and unreasonable, mm -hmm. and that is what we're talking about. If I may, just very briefly, I was going to lift up something that you said, too, in the piece regarding that Always sort of falling into the trap. I, said. <laughs> I, knew, I knew you might want to stick around for this. If, <laughs> if for nothing else, then to correct then to correct me if I get you wrong here. But one of the things that I thought James, that James said when we were talking before I wrote the vice piece, um, or while I was working on the vice piece, um, that I thought was so important to this conversation, you know, they talk, they talked about on the friendly atheist about how, you know, I was falling into the same trap as Christian apologists, right? That I was, I was sort of implicating atheism. And it's true that, you know, Richard Spencer does not represent movement atheism. He's not actively involved in it. But as James pointed out to me when we were talking about this piece, Spencer's atheism is not incidental to his worldview. It's actually linked to his white supremacy. And he talks about that in his second interview with, with McAfee, with David McAfee. And, you know, to I think that when we don't sort of push back against Richard Spencer, when we don't condemn him, we're missing out on an opportunity to demonstrate that atheism does not have to lead to an oppositional attitude between people, that it does not have to lead to an oppositional attitude toward difference, um, which in his interview with McAfee, Spencer says is part of why he rejects religion and part of why he's an atheist. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's not just as simple as saying, well, Richard Spencer happens to be an atheist, so we should you know, condemn him because we're atheists and he happens to be an atheist. No, he has spoken about atheism. He's spoken about humanism when he reposted the interview <laughs> on his really? own website. Yeah. <laughs> when, well, yeah, when he reposted the interview on his own website, Richard Spencer retitled it, The Alt-Right and Secular Humanism. Oh, gross. So he's, so he's making the case that these things are linked. And I think we have, uh, an, if you don't, if you're not comfortable with the idea of it being an obligation, I think we have an opportunity to show that there are other forms of atheism and humanism, and that Richard Spencer doesn't actually represent the views and values of humanism, certainly, and of movement atheism, we would hope. Right, right. Does I that mean, accurately re represent your view, James? <laughs> it Did absolutely you you? does. Okay, good. And I totally have to go. Thank you so much. All right. right. Thanks for joining yeah, thank, us, thanks, James. James. Good to talk to you always. But yeah, I just want to finish off saying that, you know, there are so many ways that the atheist movement can engage with religion. I don't think that there's 
anything inherently wrong with it being, you know, critical of religion. That's all fine and good, but it's the ways in which and the people that end up being propped up, you know, the the doorways to having these alt-right light people come in or the anti-Muslim and anti-Semitic uh, talking points. And if you don't push back hard enough on those, then these people will latch on. Right. Well, it's not just fine and good. It's actually, I mean, I think, you know, one of the contributions that atheists as a movement, as a community have to make is some of these criticisms of religion. Now, certainly we're not the only ones. There are also people within religious communities who are making criticisms. But I think we have an important role to play there. And I think, unfortunately, what happens is when we tolerate um, or when we sort of uh, not just make space for, but kind of lift up these other kinds of criticisms of religion that link the criticism of religion to racism and sexism and so on, what we do is we muddy the waters exactly. and we actually end up harming people who are doing really vital, valuable religious criticism work. Absolutely. So and I'd say that for the ex-Muslim community too, when you, you know, prop up the wrong kinds of people who are uh, echoing far right talking points and you muddy the water and you just in general just pull the conversation back a few steps there there continues to be like you know no progress made overall so yeah i think that's a good place to leave it yeah well thanks so much for having both of us on i really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and you know i my hope is that you know i certainly as i said earlier i'm not an authority on a lot of these things i'm just trying to be a part of a conversation. And mm -hmm. so I really, you know, I look forward to seeing other people making, you know, and, and I know that other people are and have been having these conversations, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I, I really am grateful for all the people who are writing and speaking out about these things in ways that, um, you know, I'm limited by my own circumstances and expertise and all of that. And so thank you for all that you're doing in that conversation and James, of course, and everyone else. And, and I appreciate the opportunity to just be a small part of it. So thank you for inviting me on. Yeah. And thank you so much for writing that article that got a very important uh, conversation started, right? I think eventually if someone keeps poking, 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 then something has got to resonate with someone, like someone of major influence, maybe someday. But yeah, till then so. we keep trying, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, you take care. It was a pleasure chatting. Yeah, thanks. Same to you, and have a nice day. You too, bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of Polite Conversations. You can support this podcast by sharing the shit out of it, making some noise about it, or contributing via Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash nice mangoes. No Ian mangoes. Also, you can follow me on Twitter at nice mangoes. If you want to make a one time donation instead of a monthly Patreon one, you can do so via PayPal, nicemangoes.blog at gmail.com. Remember, no E in mangoes. If you've got an interesting story and would potentially like to be a guest, you can email me there too. A special thanks to Dylan Beck for theme music, sound, and production help. Music